my description of demons is persons without bodies. It's very important to realize you're dealing with a person. In the early years of my ministry, I suffered from intense depression that would come over me and rest upon me like a dark cloud and shut me in, keep me from communicating. And I struggled with it. I did everything. I prayed, I fasted, I reckoned myself dead, I knew the scriptures. And the more I prayed and fasted, the worse it got. And I had no remedy. And one day I was reading Isaiah chapter 60, 61. And it said, in place of the spirit of heaviness, the garment of prayer. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, that's your problem. A spirit of heaviness, of depression. And when I knew that I was dealing with a person and not myself, you see, I'd been blaming myself for all of this. When I discovered it was another person, I was 80% of the way to victory. And actually, I understood by revelation that it was a familiar spirit. That is a spirit that follows a family up. And I realized the same spirit had affected my father for many years. So all I needed was one other scripture. Let me share it with you. Joel 2, 32. It shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. I called on the name of Jesus and I was delivered. This thing, it was like a heavenly vacuum cleaner. It came down over my shoulders and just sucked this thing out. And I had struggled with it for years until I recognized it was not myself. It was another person seeking to afflict me. And I want you to understand, when you once realize you're dealing with a person who is not yourself, you're about 80% of the way to deliverance. Now, as I understand it, and I, let me say I've been dealing with demons for more than 30 years. I first got involved in 1963. Some people said, well, Brother Prince will soon give it up. He'll change his doctrine. I have to say at the age of 80, I haven't given it up and I haven't changed my doctrine. And I'll tell you one reason, it's scriptural and number two, it works. I want to offer you three objectives that demons have. Number one, to torment and torture. They are the torturers. Number two, to keep you from knowing Christ as Savior. And number three, if you come to know Christ as Savior, then to keep you from serving him effectively. Now we have to distinguish between two things, what's called the flesh and demons or evil spirits. The flesh is the old carnal nature that every one of us have inherited from Adam. All of us are descendants from Adam. And Adam did not beget any children until he was a rebel. And every descendant of Adam has the nature of a rebel in him. That's the old man. Now, the other thing that we deal with is evil spirits. And it's important to know what you're dealing with because the remedies are completely different. See, I was dealing with the spirit of heaviness and I was trying to deal with it as if it were the flesh. I was trying to crucify it because that's the remedy for the flesh. But you can't crucify a demon. Nor can you cast out the flesh. You have to know what you're dealing with. A man came to me once and he said, Brother Prince, I want you to cast this demon out of me. I said, what's your problem? And he began to tell, tell me his difficulty in relating to his wife. I said, I don't think I can cast that out. It's not a demon, it's your fleshly nature. You have to crucify it. So we need to know, am I dealing with my flesh or am I dealing with a demon? And I will give you a little list of characteristic activities of demons. Number one, they entice. There's not a single person here above the age of six who has not at some time been enticed to do evil. Very often it comes in words. Well, you see that nice gold pencil there? Pick it up. Nobody will know. If you dropped your pencil, they would do it to you. Anything that comes to you in words comes from a person. So you know that enticement comes from a person, a demon. Number two, they harass, or I think we say in English, harass. I'm bilingual and I have to remember which language I'm speaking. 
Anyhow, harass or harass, that's what they do. I have this little example in my mind, it's just not directly based on any single experience. There's this businessman, he's had a terrible day in the office. Everything went wrong, the air conditioning failed, his secretary didn't type his letters right. And then he got in the car to go home and he got in a jam in the motorway and he spent an hour sitting in his car opening all the fumes. And finally when he gets home, his wife hasn't got supper ready and the children are running around screaming. And at that moment, as they say in America, he blows his stack. He loses control. He begins to shout and scream. And that demon of anger that has been following him around all day slips in. And after that, he's a slightly different person. From after that, at times, something comes over him and he wounds the people he loves most, his wife and children. And his wife looks at him from time to time and sees something in his eyes she never saw before. And then he's repentant and penitent and he says, I'm sorry, I don't know what made me do it. Well, we do know what made him do it. It was the demon of anger, see? It had harassed him or harassed him and in the moment of weakness, slipped in. Then demons torment. They are the tormentors. They torment spiritually with the suggestion, God doesn't love you, you're not really saved. That's a common form of torment. They torment emotionally with fear. They torment physically with all sorts of horrible things like arthritis and so on. They are the tormentors. And Jesus said, listen, if you don't forgive your fellow believer, God will deliver you to the tormentors. Who are they? The demons. A lot of Christians are in the hands of demons because they've refused to forgive some other person. Then demons compel. They make us do things we don't really want to do. That some of the things they compel you to do are really comical. I had a letter after a deliverance service from a woman aged 25 and she said, for the first week in my life that I can remember, I haven't been biting my nails. What made her bite her nails? A demon. Can you believe that? I know it's true. And then demons enslave. They make you slaves. You see, people can sin and stop sinning if they decide. For instance, a man may get drunk and then decide he won't get drunk and he doesn't drink anymore. He's sinned, but he's not enslaved. But an alcoholic is a man who can't stop drinking. He is enslaved. Now if you put compel and enslave together, you get the word addiction. And in my personal opinion, almost every addiction of any kind is demonic. And there are a lot of respectable addictions. Some very unrespectable, some respectable. But if you are addicted, you have a problem. And your problem, I think, in 90% of the cases is a demon. Demons defile. They make us feel dirty and unclean. They project evil, impure images and thoughts and words into our minds. And I've talked with people at various times who said, just when I'm getting closest to the Lord, when I really want to worship Him, these horrible things come into my mind and I said you can be sure it's a demon anything that wants to keep you from worshiping God is a demon then demons deceive they are behind all forms of religious deception Paul said in 1st Timothy chapter 4 in the last times some will depart from the faith that's Christians giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. And believe me, my dear brothers and sisters, there are a lot of different deceiving spirits with doctrines that are demonic and they're very near to all of us. Finally, demons make people weak or sick or tired or kill them. I dealt with a woman once this is a 
remarkable situation. Seventy-two different demons came out of her. She was a respectable woman. She was a registered nurse. She was charismatic, Pentecostal, but she had 72 demons. I didn't count them, but there was a woman making a little note of the names. And in the middle of this, it lasted five hours. She said, oh, I'm so tired. I can't go on. I can't take any more. And I thought, well, poor woman, she really is tired. And then the Lord showed me, that's not the woman, that's the demon. I said, you spirit of tiredness, come out of this woman. And it said, not the woman, it said, that's right, she's always tired. She's tired when she gets up, she's tired when she's going to bed. She's too tired to read the Bible, too tired to pray. When that spirit of tiredness came out of her, she was no longer tired. We finished the deliverance. Demons make you go to sleep. There's a spirit of slumber, it's referred to both in the Old and the New Testament. Have you ever considered that you can sit up till 2 a.m. watching something that you probably shouldn't be watching on the television, but if you decide to read your Bible, you go to sleep in 10 minutes? Is that right? That's not natural. There's something there that doesn't mind your watching television, in fact, probably wants you to watch it, but does mind your reading the Bible or praying. All right, those are some activities of demons. Now, the main areas in which they operate. I have to give this in a very condensed form, you understand? I'm writing a book about it. Please pray for me. <laughs> it's not an easy book to write. I discovered about 10 different kinds of spirits or demons mentioned in the Old Testament and about 20 in the New, that's 30. But that's just a little sampling. There are hundreds of different kinds of demons. The main area that they affect, I believe, is mo emotions and attitudes. And behind every negative emotion and attitude, there is a corresponding demon. That doesn't mean you've got the demon, but that means that the demon's there trying to get you. For instance, you can get angry, and it's not a demon. It's just you, it's your flesh. But if you get angry and can't control yourself, and get angry when you don't want to get angry, that's a demon. Let me give you a list of some of the commonest names that I've dealt with. And another thing about demons is they operate in gangs. When one gets in, it opens the door for the next. And if you find certain demons, you can always look for their friends. Let's take one. Pride. Rebellion, rebellion almost always follows pride. And then witchcraft or the occult. Because 1 Samuel 15 verse 23 says, Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Wherever you find rebellion, look for witchcraft. The great historical example of this is the young people of the United States in the 1960s. Almost a whole generation went into rebellion. And almost every one of them ended in the occult. Because rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Now I thank God I saw scores of them gloriously saved and delivered. But I learned the lesson. Then one of the commonest spirits is the spirit of fear. Paul says God has not given us a spirit of fear. So it doesn't come from God. But Fear is something that we easily, all of us, give way to. And it's followed by other things like rejection. One of the commonest emotional problems in the church and in the world today is rejection. It's a sense of feeling unworthy, unwanted. Nobody really loves me. I'm on the outside looking in. And I would say in my observation, at least 20% of professing Christians today that I've met with need deliverance from rejection. It's really due to the breakup of the family because the thing that gives a child the sense of security is the love and the care of a father. And where that is missing, there's something that cries out, I don't know who I am, I don't feel secure, I don't know that people really love me. I want to tell you one thing, Jesus really loves you. 
But the devil will do his best to convince you it's true of everybody else but not you.